So it's Palm Sunday, and to you, I don't know what that might mean. Uh, To our children in our culture, it may mean some great things. It may mean some really enjoyable things. Uh, For many of us in the South, in our Bible Belt culture, it means some trite things. Like it's time to get ready to wear pastel colors. Uh, The Easter lilies are going to be in bloom or are in bloom. I don't know what an Easter lily is. Maybe, I don't know. (laughs) Picnics are going to be happening. And then there are those chocolate bunnies. Those peanut butter eggs. These are good things. We enjoy these things. But every one of us has to make sure that the cultural festivities, just like at Christmas, that they don't define the heart of what we are looking for and what we are looking forward to. And your family may practice uh, these things various different kinds of ways. Uh, We practice uh, enjoyment of cultural festivities in various different kinds of ways. But for our time this morning, I want to encourage us all to feel the weight this morning on Palm Sunday of what the Lord has done for His church. And come Easter Sunday morning, what may feel solemn and heavy today, because it should, come Easter Sunday morning, you should feel the joy of what we celebrate as finished work. So with that as the context of what we hope to do together this morning, uh, to introduce you to the passage of Scripture We're in Luke chapter 19, but let me take you for a moment back to Luke chapter 9, verse 51, where Luke gives this short little phrase that describes all of the chapter chapters and their events from Luke chapter 9 to now the journey to Jerusalem in Luke 19. And that phrase was, and he set his face towards Jerusalem. And that is Luke's way of saying, now Jesus has turned his attention to the long march to Jerusalem, where he knew what he was going to do. He knew the price that he would pay for redemption. And in Luke 9.51, all of the events, the miracles that follow, the parables that follow, the teaching that follows, Jesus has been in charge of it all with his face set towards Jerusalem. And that's the context for what we'll now read in Luke chapter 19, verses 28 to 44. Jesus set His face towards Jerusalem. He was determined to accomplish a work. And now He rides into town with staggering emotion. Not just what's been behind Him. Surely He's fatigued. This long journey, probably bad nights of sleep, contending with opposition, teaching, teaching, and teaching, which can be exhausting. And now he is entering Jerusalem for the hardest thing that could ever be done. Humanly, he's lived through hard weeks and months. Divinely, he now knows what he will do. So give your attention now. Luke chapter 19, verses 28 to 44. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And as he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead and went, those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he told them. As they were untying the colt, the owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? And they replied, The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. And as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. 
And when he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, Jesus replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. And as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, But now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Let's pray that the Lord would open our eyes and help us to understand what all of this means. Lord, would you do that? Would you open our eyes and our ears and our hearts that we might more and more understand the teaching of Jesus, the gospel of Jesus, the call of Jesus upon our lives? And so we ask this and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Tears are complicated things, aren't they? You know, why do you cry? Well, it depends. Uh, We cry for all kinds of reasons. Tears can be shed at times of joy. Tears can be shed in times of sorrow. They can be shed at moments of physical pain. They can be shed at moments of dreadful fear. Tears can be shed at at defining moments in our life when we know we're living on the precipice of something really significant, like a graduation or a wedding, when you know that times are about to change once and for all. Tears can be shed, whether joy or sorrow or pain. Tears are complicated things. I was talking with a young man, a student this week, who's preparing for his own wedding, and he told me how just a few years ago, when he was a young teenager, he played the role of best man in his older brother's wedding. And he said, all of the wedding pictures are ruined. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I was standing up there with my brother, and then the bride came through the doors, and I looked at my brother, and I saw him get emotional. And then it just dawned on me that life was forever changing. All of the memories he and I had had together were changing at that moment. And he said, all I could see was what was behind us. I couldn't see what was before us. And he's now an uncle, by the way. There's a newfound joy, right? But tears were flowing from his eyes. He said, I couldn't quit crying the whole wedding because of the flood of all the memories and thoughts. And it just felt like this big turning of a page. And it was over for us, so it felt. Because he could only see what was behind them, but not what was before them. Tears are complicated things. We weep, we cry for various kinds of reasons. And Jesus cries, He weeps in our passage. And several times in Scripture, we're told of accounts where Jesus weeps, where Jesus cries. And I think as we prepare to hear what we're going to hear, I think it's important to make that distinction that Jesus being fully God and fully man has tensions within Him that we don't understand. He felt all the fatigue and all the drain from His journey and from His ministry just as we do at the end of a long, hard season of life. Because physically, He was fully man. But he was fully God, and he knew everything that was about to play out 
during this Passion Week, what we call Holy Week, that is filled, young people, if you hear that language of Holy Week or Passion Week and you don't know what that is, that is the key events that are going to culminate in the redemption of God's people. The hard things that Jesus lived through for our good. And my hope this morning is just to touch on some of those, however briefly, to help them be on our minds this week as we live through what is Holy Week. And so Jesus will weep over Jerusalem with the complexity of everything that he knows behind him and certainly what he knows is before him and before the people who are rejecting him. So three points this morning, all to turn our attention towards the good and the joy of Easter Sunday morning next week. And the first point is this, the King has come. The King has come. Jesus rides into Jerusalem as a king on a baby donkey. Now that should capture our attention visually. A king on a donkey. We would think of a king on a war horse making his triumphal entry to celebrate and to be praised. Jesus comes in on a donkey and actually Zechariah, the prophet Zechariah said this. We heard this in our call to worship or in our reflection. It was our call to worship. Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And so here Jesus is fulfilling one of many Old Testament promises, as he will do throughout the Passion Week. He rides into town to be celebrated yet on a donkey. Now, the whole business with the donkey is fascinating. Listen again to how this plays out. Verses 30 and 31. Jesus says, Go to the village ahead of you. Two of his disciples. Go to the village ahead of you. As you enter it, you'll find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, Hey, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. And those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he told them. And they were untying the colt, and its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? And they replied, The Lord needs it. And so they brought it back to Jesus, threw their cloaks on it, and put Jesus on it. What in the world is going on here? Jesus, like a master of ceremonies... He has been in charge entirely, the the complete entire time throughout his ministry. He is the master of ceremonies. And here we get a little glimpse as to how he is fully in charge. He knows he's going to fulfill this promise from Zechariah that the people were familiar with. And he is now going to visibly demonstrate who he is. And I know as you read that on your own, it can sound a bit mysterious, As if this is a Jedi mind trick where Jesus is saying, you know, give the colt to the Lord needs it. And everyone's like, okay, take the colt. Um, These are not the droids you're looking for, right? If you remember that scene in Star Wars. It seems mysterious. It seems weird. Um, Some of you will think, well, maybe I'll try that line in Greenwood this week. You know, go to the Nissan a dealership and get in the car and say, the Lord needs it. Right? We'll take the Nissan. None of that is what this is about. This is about the Lord demonstrating on full display who He is. And He is now associating with those messianic promises like Zechariah's in chapter 9 because He has been the master of ceremonies. He is now symbolically revealing His identity He's doing it carefully. He's doing it intentionally. He's doing it meaningfully. And it was written down, recorded for our good. That just as those people saw the dots connect, we might see the dots connect. That Jesus really is the master of ceremonies, fully in charge all the time and accomplishing his purposes. 
It's almost here, some have said, that Jesus is making a parody of the world and its kings and their triumphal entries, which would have expected a war horse, which would have expected a strong and military display as a triumphal procession, as a triumphal entry. And here's Jesus riding in on a donkey, gentle and lowly. It's almost comical. It's almost comical from the world's eyes. You can almost picture Mr. Bean riding a donkey into Jerusalem. It's that absurd if you know who Mr. Bean is. It's like, this is not a a warrior. This is not the entrance that a king would have. Oh, yes, it is. If you understand what we talked about weeks ago with the unexpected left-handed power of God. The world would say, put him on a war horse, surround him with soldiers. Jesus says, nah, I'll be on a donkey. And I'll ride in gentle and lowly. Because I'm the king and I do nothing the way the world expects it. The left-handed power of God. We never saw it coming. We never expected it to play this way. Jesus once again fails to meet the expectations of His people. He's always redefining those expectations. Meanwhile, the people are rejoicing. The people are waving palm branches as predicted in Psalm 118. They're laying down their cloaks on the road. Perhaps... Our best way of understanding that imagery is rolling out the red carpet. Uh, give, this, give this one a, a distinguished path. Roll out the red carpet. Put your cloaks down and let him ride in on those. On a donkey. And while he does this, the people are proclaiming, Hosanna, son of David. Which, don't read that as I did as a child. I thought that was the equivalent of them singing, for he's a jolly good fellow, for he's a jolly good fellow, which nobody can deny. That's not what this is. They are taking Old Testament language, language attributed to the Messiah, that when he comes, Hosanna, he will save us, he will heal us, he will deliver us because he is The promised one. And so this is liturgical language. This is the language of praise. This is the language of worship. And they're attributing everything they knew in those Old Testament promises of a Messiah. And having seen His miracles, having seen His healing, they're pointing to Him and they are saying, He is indeed the one. And so they've laid down their cloaks They've offered him liturgical praise, singling him out as the Lamb of God. And he does this, remember, riding into the holy city, the capital city of Jerusalem, at the time of the Passover, and Jesus now willingly identifies as the Lamb of God, as the promised Messiah. On this, Tim Keller says this, essentially Jesus now is saying, I am who I am, either crown me and worship me or kill me and have nothing to do with me. And I think he's right. Those really are the two options. We will either crown him and worship him or we will want nothing to do with him. The one thing we can't do is just like Jesus. Just think he's okay. Right? You will either crown him and worship him, or you will reject him and have nothing to do with him. There is no middle ground with Jesus. So says Jesus. And really, that is the same conclusion. Anyone who reads the Scriptures, anyone who hears God's Word, that is the the question being pressed upon every one of us, always. Crown him or have nothing to do with him. And so as we approach Easter, that's that's the first application I, I hope to press on us and on our families. Are you trying to just like him a little bit in the middle? He says, crown me 
or kill me. You've got to make a decision. You've got to make a choice. Is he who he says that he is or is he not? Now remember, Jesus is intensifying the conflict with the religious leaders. Uh, I shared with you last week words uh, from Jesus in Luke 22 uh, where he calls them out and says that they will be judged most harshly. Listen to what he says now in Luke 19, 27. This is the parable of the ten minas and the ten uh, rulers and the returning king. And at the end of that parable, I'm just going to read his conclusion. Listen to what he says. Listen to how he has turned up the tension. As the master of ceremonies, he is now saying it's time to fight. He says this, But those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and slaughter them in front of me. Do you hear how he's intensifying? That's the call right there. Crown me or kill me. Or be killed by me if you won't bend your knee in worship of the king. Jesus has suddenly become increasingly bold and clear. He is no longer stalling. He is now accelerating the issue. He's he's accelerating the conflict with the religious leaders. He's in charge. They aren't. Uh, To this point, he has been slowing things down, and now he is speeding things up. It is time for the events of the Passion Week to unfold. And as the master of ceremonies, they will. Because the hour has come. The hour has come for all of this to reach its climax. We've seen through our studies in the Gospels in weeks past how many times After a miracle or after a teaching, Jesus would say, now don't go tell anyone what I did. Or he would say, my hour has not yet come. My time has not yet come. Don't go talk about what you've seen and heard. That's Jesus as the master of ceremonies, slowing things down. It wasn't time for things to climax. But Jesus now says the hour has come. It is time for the conflict. It is time for the action. And so Jesus now, in in supporting that and accelerating things, He receives the worship of the people. He doesn't distance Himself from any messianic claims or assertions. He now identifies with them. And this angers the Pharisees. We heard in our passage, I think it's verse 39 and 40, It says, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples because they were worshiping Jesus with messianic language. And Jesus said, I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out, which is a reference to Isaiah and what Isaiah said all of creation would do in worshiping the Lord. So see, Jesus is looking the Pharisees boldly in the face. And he's looking this hour boldly in the face. And he's saying, it is time. The hour has come. What must happen, must happen. And it's in this context that the passage says, as he rode into Jerusalem, Jesus weeps. Jesus cries. But why? He's finally being worshipped as the Messiah. The people are responding. They're throwing down their cloaks. They're waving their their palm branches. Isn't he satisfied? Isn't this what he wanted? No. Jesus weeps because he knows what is going to happen in Jerusalem. What he must physically, emotionally, spiritually endure. But more than that, the passage seems to be clear that Jesus is weeping for Jerusalem. Jesus knows that essentially 40 years later, Jerusalem will fall. Jerusalem will be destroyed. The temple will be destroyed. And he even graphically gives the picture of this. It's a clear connection to the fall of Jerusalem. Listen to what he says. 
Starting in verse 41, as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. And he said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. And they will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. If you've ever read or heard, or there are little videos even, of the Jewish historian Josephus and his record of the fall of Jerusalem. It's exactly as it says there. They were hemmed in on three sides. Over a five-month siege, the walls would crumble. Jerusalem would literally starve to death as their food supply for five months was cut off. There are stories of cannibalism of children taking place within the walls of Jerusalem as they starved to death. And they fought, and they fought, and they tried, and they tried. But it would be a horrible finish for Jerusalem. And Jesus, 40 years prior to that, says, that is, that is what is coming for you. Because you have rejected the Prince of Peace. You would have nothing to do with Him. He was before you, and you despised Him. And so Jesus has words here, or He has tears that are filled with all kinds of staggering emotion. Seeing the holy city praising but not understanding. Knowing that they would put him to death. A shameful death on a cross. And Jesus weeps. He weeps for everything that has happened He weeps for everything that will happen. Now, this is the redemptive hour. This is the hour, not a 60-minute hour, but a period. This is the hour where redemptive history will culminate in all the events of the Passion Week. Very simply, they are these. It is the hour of His anguish in the garden. The Garden of Gethsemane, where in Luke 22 we're told, and being in anguish, Jesus prayed more earnestly, and His sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Secondly, it's the hour of His betrayal by a disciple into the hands of unjust men. Mark in chapter 14 says it this way, The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go, for here comes my betrayer. Thirdly, it's the hour for His public ridicule and torture. Matthew says in chapter 27, Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand. Then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. And after they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him, and then they led him away to crucify him. And then fourthly, John says in chapter 17, it is the hour for his sacrificial death. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. And so feel that tension for a moment. The people are rejoicing. And Jesus is weeping. Such a great disconnect between worshiper and Lord. 
He sees what is before them and all of his people. And he weeps. He hurts. You ever wondered if there's a great disconnect between your worship and the living Lord? The things that we're excited about, and yet the Lord and his weeping. There could be a great disconnect between disciple and Lord. And it's modeled here. The people had no conscious understanding of what was coming. But what was coming? What was coming that they could not see? Summarized beautifully in this hymn by William Howe. A hymn Sandra McCracken has brought back to life. Who is this is the name of the hymn. And we've sung it here. We're not going to sing it today. But listen to these words that capture what the Messiah would do for His church. Who is this? A man of sorrows, walking sadly life's hard way, homeless, weary, sighing, weeping over sin and Satan's sway. It is our God, our glorious Savior, who above the starry sky is for us a place preparing where no tear can dim the eye. Who is this? Behold Him shedding drops of blood upon the ground. Who is this? Despised, rejected, mocked, insulted, beaten, and bound? It is our God who gifts and graces on His church is pouring down, who shall smite in holy vengeance all his foes beneath his throne. And then lastly, who is this that hangs there dying while the rude world scoffs and scorns, numbered with the malefactors, torn with nails and crowned with thorns? It is our God who lives forever mid the shining ones on high in the glorious golden city, reigning everlastingly. I love that hymn because it it plays off that tension of who is this suffering so much, living through the worst that life could ever offer someone? And the answer is, that's our God. That's our Savior who's enduring those things. And He's doing it for His church. He's doing it for His people that we would not have to pay the price for our own sins, but that He would do it for us. And lastly, why would He do that? Well, because He he offered a prayer in Luke chapter 22, verse 42, that God's will be done. God's will be done. In Luke chapter 22, Jesus prays this in Gethsemane. Father, if You are willing... Take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. God's will be done. You know, those may be the four hardest words that we will ever pray. God's will be done. And I say that only because it's so hard to say it and to say it truthfully. God's will be done. Because you know what you and I are always wanting? My will be done. I want this to work out the way that I want it to work out, right? God's will be done are the four hardest words for a sinner to pray. But they are the four best words that a sinner can ever pray. God's will be done. And the answer to that prayer may be that the results are hard That we're to live through something really hard. God's will be done. Because God uses hard things for our good. But we can know whatever we live through is for our ultimate good. Which is why Jesus prayed that prayer. Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. And so it's Holy Week. The triumphal entry, Palm Sunday, is the beginning of the hardest events that Jesus would endure for our redemption. 
That's what Holy Week is. That's what the Passion Week is. The dark hours of being betrayed, being forsaken, being alone, being ridiculed, mocked, beaten, tortured, torn, crucified. But he prayed, not my will, but thy will be done, because he had set his face towards Jerusalem. He had work to do. And he did it for what would be called his bride. He did it for what would be called his church. And he did it willingly. He did it lovingly. And for us, Palm Sunday in the week of Passion, Holy Week, it is a time to feel the weight of what our Savior has done for us. I'll conclude with this. What Jesus says in John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18. He says, The reason my Father loves me is that I laid down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me. You see, He's the master of ceremonies. But I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. And so you see the master of ceremonies who's been in charge since day one. He has been timing all of this. He has orchestrated all of this. It is leading to a grand and beautiful conclusion to be continued next Sunday morning on Easter Sunday. Let's pray that God would give us a week where we reflect meaningfully and purposefully on what Christ has done for His church. Let's pray. Lord, that is our prayer. <clears throat> would we worship You meaningfully and understandingly of what You have done for us? We deserved none of it. And you did it fully, you did it freely, and Lord, it is sufficient for our salvation. So Lord, as we consider these events this week in our own lives and in our own families, may we return with glad and sincere hearts next week to hear of the joy of Easter morn. And we ask this and pray it together in Jesus' name, amen.